Good evening, golf fans, and welcome to a special Open Championship episode of the Big D Podcast. Before I bring in the special guests, please subscribe, like, comment, and share the Spunky Spectrum Sports YouTube page. I have a lot of other useful golf information coming in the next few weeks, and uh, I can't wait to see a golf's f- and final major of 2021. Well, uh, if you remember the PJ Championship, uh, this guy uh, did such a great job. I brought him back uh, from uh, north of the border. Is uh, my buddy uh, uh, golf, NFL, NHL, DFS writer Jeff Ulrich. Jeff, uh, is it warm in your neck of the woods? It is actually, man. I mean, it's boiling up here. It's been really like a heat wave the last two or three weeks. So. Warmth is not the issue up here like it normally is. It's uh, if anything, it's been too hot. So I'm definitely been uh, been keeping good, man, for sure. Uh, let me tell you, in Florida, the heat is uh, heat and humidity are two of our biggest adversaries. <laughs> so uh, speaking of adversaries, uh, what in the world has happened with Bryson DeChambeau? This Bryson DeChambeau caddy situation. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty interesting. Obviously, you know, you've got one of the top players in the game going through a caddy change. And I mean, I, we were talking before, you know, about the timing of it and all that. But, you know, maybe for Bryson, it was just, you know, I think Bryson is just a finicky guy. And if something isn't working for him, you know, he'd rather just, you know, part with part ways and, and, and work on it right away rather than let it fester. So I kind of respect Bryson for that. You know, he's, he's more of a guy who just wants to keep moving forward focus on his goals no matter what. But um, it is kind of bad timing with this major championship coming up, man. I mean, especially with the Open, you know, uh, it, it's just one of the it, – it's it's just been not like his, his, his cup of tea so far. Three, uh, three, three Open championship starts, uh, no top tens, a T51 is best finish. So it's going to be interesting to see what he does this week for sure. Yeah, and uh, I can't think of an out of a – Worst time to switch caddies and before an open championship where nobody played last year because of the pandemic. So that knowledge you would get from playing a met a masters, a US Open or PGA is not not in the old brain. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, speaking of the open championship, uh, after not being on the uh, golf calendar la- last year, this year we are back finally at a Royal St. George for the 149th edition of the Open. So uh, what do you think is going to happen this weekend? So, I mean, I, I really think this is going to be like a fun event. I mean, Royal St. George, is, it doesn't get like the, the glamour and stuff that some of the other ones do, maybe Carnoustie or St. Andrews, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a pure links test. It's an interesting little golf course. It's a par 70 set on the seaside. It's not overly long. But it's got some big bunkers, and and I I don't know if people remember this, but I mean like when you hit when you get penalized here or you you fall in one of those bunkers, like it's it can be murder, right? Like it, it can be it can end your golf tournament. Thomas Bjorn found that out in 2011. It's got some OB that players have to deal with. Dustin Johnson found that out in 2011 as well, late. And um, I, I think it's gonna lead to another kind of funky event where, you know some some guys some some top players probably gonna get some bad bounces maybe late in the event and i wouldn't be shocked if we another saw another little bit of a surprise winner maybe we won't see like ben curtis you know like 500 to one winner or something or 300 to one winner but you could definitely see a pretty surprise winner here i think there's a lot of dudes who have a shot at this golf course um like a really high number of guys like people you know and i know people will consider a lot of names but you know, like you can probably even stretch it further. Um, I think this one's going to be wide open. Yeah, how about in back-to-back years, Ben Curtis and Todd Hamilton both won the Claire Show. Yeah, no, I mean that was a that was a crazy stretch. I mean that's <laughs> those guys. I mean, you know, Ben Curtis at least had like a couple wins under his belt, but I mean uh, Todd Hamilton, yeah, really out of nowhere. So definitely uh, one of the weirdest major championship stretches there, two thousand three, two thousand four. Yeah, when I think of Royal St. George, uh, first off, how about a how about a name of a city, Sandwich, England? That yeah, makes us all hungry, right? I know. No, it's a great name. Uh, it always re- reminds me of this. That's where this is located too. Whenever I hear the name, I'm like, oh yeah, it's the one that's in Sandwich, right? The 
the funky name ones. So, but yeah, Darren Clark here won the last time out too. We mentioned like surprise winners. I mean, Darren Clark is a quality player. He's got a bunch of, you know, international wins under his belt, but when he won at the time, he was 42. He was in, you know, he didn't have any form. He wasn't playing good golf. Like he just came and won randomly. So, so I mean, I mean, this, this golf course tends to just uh, gives us some, some weird ones. So I'm expecting another one like that. Yeah. When I think of this golf course one, Unlike the bunkers in the U.S. where you could literally play from them, the bunkers in the British Isles, all legitimate hazards. I've seen many yeah. times where guys have to play out sideways or little, you've got no play. Absolutely. And again, like I can't emphasize enough, that's one of the biggest features of Royal St. George's. I mean, these aren't just like pop bunkers. Like some of these are like, like they're the hardest pop bunkers you'll see on the open rota they're they're right up there with any any of the venues and and that's definitely one of like the more that's one of the things that does set this apart a little bit i mean it's it's not like that crazy a layout or anything now the fairways can get skinny in parts and there's some dog legs and stuff like that and there's quite a bit of fescue and and, and rough it feels like at least from what i've seen compared to some of the other opens but um it, it, these bunkers and the way they're set up and where they're located like you know, it, it can mean like a slightly off center shot can just lead to like a, a two stroke penalty almost. And, uh, you know, Justin Ray from, uh, I, I can't, actually, I can't remember where he's from, but Justin Ray, uh, Justin data golf at, uh, on Twitter. Um, you know, he pointed out this, you've seen the lowest greens and regulations percentages at this venue for the open championship over the last, I think it was 20 years, both times came at Royal St. George's. So, you know, missed greens mean low, like high scoring, mean good scrambling. You need your good scrambling. And um, it's probably what we're going to see again this week. Yeah, so uh, now we switch our attention from the golf course to one of our favorite things, betting. So uh, if you look at the uh, DK Sports, sports book Club, yep. by the way, uh, please gamble responsibly. We don't need anybody betting $5 million on this tournament. Or well, five million pounds in the UK. <laughs> I mean, if you have five five million pounds, then yeah, you know, you can limit yourself to maybe just a hundred thousand pounds or something. If, but, if, yeah, if no, everybody, in all seriousness, for sure, yeah, responsibility always a good a good way to go about it. <laughs> if everybody bet the over on missed penalty kicks yesterday, then you might have a few extra pounds. <laughs> That's right. So if you look at the DK Sports book, John Rahm's the favorite at plus 800. Brooks Kepka and Xander Shelfley are both plus 1800. Roy McIlroy and Jordan Spieth are plus 1900. Justin Thomas is plus 2050. Uh, Justin Johnson's 2250. Uh, Victor Hopland's plus 2500. You got Louis Ursation's plus 2800. And then uh, Patrick Cantley, Paul Casey, Matthew Fitzpatrick, and Pat Reed are plus 3,000. And uh, Bryson at plus 30, Bryson and Colin Morcal are 35 to 1. So, uh, yep. what is your betting call looking like this week? Yeah, so, you know, it, it's not fully finalized. I mean, I definitely have a little piece of Louie, um, you know, uh, more around plus 33 in the odds for me that I got him at. But um, I, I just feel like, you know, again, this is a, an event where, you know, length off the tee isn't a big deal. Louis really, really talented around the greens. He's turned himself into one of the best putters in the world. And I think that part of the game is going to matter more here than, than just being able to pound it off the tee. And look, Usti was, was competitive at the first two opens where the courses was, were longer. The, you know, the, the conditions were a little bit, yeah, I don't want to say tougher, but just more in line with where the bigger hitters had an advantage. I don't think the bigger hitters necessarily going to have that same advantage. So in a lot of ways, I mean, this should be like huge advantage to Usti. Um, I think the odds are down, but that's fine. I'll, I'll take a shot on him. He's just playing too good in these majors for me to go off. Um, you know, other than that, I'm tempted to take a shot on Justin Thomas. Whenever his odds get over plus 2000, I have a little note. You should just be betting him. This is a player who just wins way too often uh, not to bet at plus 2000. He has improved his links record over the last few years. T11 at the Open in 2019. Top 10s at the Scottish Open the last two times it was played. I think those are fair odds on, Dust on Justin Thomas. Um, and if I was going to bet one top player this week, that's probably who it would be. I'm not sure if I'm going to fire there because there's just too many guys 
And like I said, I feel like this open is so wide open that there's just too many guys like plus 3,500 and above that I want to take shots on. So that's kind of how the top of the board is shaping up for me anyways right now. Well, you name one top guy. I've got another top top guy who uh, confu- whose odds confuse me. And then said, okay. DJ, uh, I mean, when I saw 2250, I'm like, woof. I don't remember DJ yep. being 20 plus 2250 and a major, but everybody will look at the final rounds and final round the U.S. Open. But to me, DJ could get so hot. Remember, he was in contention in 2011, and one. I think he finished tied for second with Phil at like two under and three shots behind Paul, but. And I wouldn't necessarily call DJ a great links player, but the fact that he's always there, he he can play any golf course, he can play in the wind. And I think of this course, the long pull, length may not necessarily matter, but it might on those long pull fours. Because if you hit in a second shot from 240 compared to 210, you get a four or five line compared to a into a rescue club makes a difference. Absolutely, man. And, and it's a good point by you. Like, you know, the par four scoring is, is going to be massively important here this week. I mean, we have 11 par fours between 400 and 500 yards. So there's no short drivable par fours. You know, there's, there's nothing like fancy like that. It's just straight up. You got to be good on the par fours. DJ traditionally just one of the best par four scores out there. He's looked, he's looked a little bit more wild off the tee than usual. Like the putter has spiked for him a little bit in spots, but the short game hasn't looked good. I, I'm just, I'm a little bit worried about, about just, you know, where the sharpness of his game. I'm just not sure if it's there to like go all the way at an open championship. It's very tempting though. And, and like, we're going to talk about this on a couple players. I mean, I think Bryson is another one of plus 3,500. You're just not going to see odds like this on Dustin and Bryson very often over their career. And I know it's the open and it's, you know, it's a wild, and I've already made the point, like, it's a wild event, anything could happen, but those are big odds, and these are, like, two of the best players in the world, like, top 10 players, and you're getting, you know, their odds have spiked, right? So, definitely, like, you know, if you want to pick out one of those players, absolutely. You know, if I was taking one of them, I'd probably take Dustin over Bryson. I think they're both in similar spots, whereas their games maybe aren't as good as they, you know, the results haven't been there for them lately, but maybe their games aren't that far off, and you're getting a boost in the odds, so... Uh, for me, like I said, my money will go on Justin Thomas if I go to the top, but um, Bryson is uh, Bryson is kind of worth considering, too. It's just a big price. I'm glad you mentioned Bryson because at 35 to 1, Bryson, Colin Moncal, and Terrell Haddon all grouped together. And uh, when Bryson, how, how long were Bryson thoughts of like Augusta, Peachy, and the U.S. Open because he was not 35 to 1? How much, sorry, what? How, uh, how long were Bryson's odds at the first three majors? Because they were not 35 oh. to 1, I guarantee you that. No, no, no. I think Bryson was around plus 1,000, plus 1,200 at the Masters. And then he, he they definitely skyrocketed a bit for the U.S. Open. Uh, obviously, he had that nice run, grabbed a win at the API. But, um, you know, going to the U.S. Open, he wasn't in, like, terrific form. So they went up a bit. Um, but this is... Um, this is basically triples odds from the Masters. It's a good point. So, yeah, um, you know, seeing John Rahm down there, I mean, you know, under plus 1,000, like you said, those are even shorter odds than we saw on the favorite at the Masters, I do believe. And, um, again, for an event like the Open, where there's a lot of factors, the wind, the crazy bunkering, you know, a little bit more luck involved, it's just not a spot where I take a shot on the the the, the favorite. I guess the, the shot was to do it at – at, uh, at the U.S. Open, obviously, but uh, not here for me. And so who are a couple lower golfers you really are considering betting? Yeah, so, I mean, this is where, like, you know, things get really interesting. Like, I, you know, after kind of, like, the plus 3,000 range, because I think there's so many players that are live. And, you know, it's a good reminder, like, Shane Lowry – was kind of one of those guys in 2019. You know, I believe he went off around plus 7,000 or something in 2019. If my memory is serving me correct, he certainly was like bigger than plus 4,000. So I think there's a ton of names like that that you could consider. And, and one of my favorites is going to be Mark Leishman at plus 7,000. Um, 
you know, T3 in his last start at the Travelers, put in a massive final round. You know, he's feeling good about his game. Look, we saw Mark Leishman, Dylan, at the at the Masters, top 10, top five, like in the final group of a major earlier this year already. People already forget, but this guy's got a great open championship record. Lost in a playoff in 2015. People have always said if Leishman's going to win a major, this is probably it. Um, he's got the good short game. He's got good irons, and he's one of the best putters on tour when he gets hot. Um, I think these are fantastic odds. I mean, I'm a little bit surprised that, you know, Leishman – is like almost double like Tommy Fleetwood, who's not coming in with his good form, or Scotty Scheffler, who has like no open championship experience. It's the guy who lost in a playoff in this very major before, um, has a bunch of top fives and is playing well. Um, I, I think Mark Leishman is, is very live this week. Uh, again, probably my favorite guy like in that range, but there's, there's others I'd consider as well. Um, you know, I think Daniel Berger is very tempting, a plus 5,500. He's a very good iron player, very good putter. Um, he can win like a little grind fest as well. I think Sergio is even interesting, but you know, all those guys do have shorter odds than, than Leishman. Who's, who's definitely one of my favorites. I'm glad you mentioned Berger because if you think of where he won Pebble beach and I know Pebble yep. beach in the open are different, but Pebble beach is known for all kinds of crazy win and Berger won that. And he's done well in majors, even on longer course where you wouldn't think Berger would benefit and I know everybody will say well he disappointed me at the John Deere listen I don't remember the John Deere classic winner ever winning the Masters I'm sorry Lucas Glover but uh, it's a little different winning the John Deere and uh, in the open sorry open and the John Deere back to back it has happened it has happened but not very often um I'm trying to think I want to say Spieth did it maybe Spieth this no, he won the Travelers. The yeah, I know he won the Travelers, and then but he didn't play the John Deere that year. I uh, think Spieth. Yeah, no, in 2015, Spieth won the John Deere, and then he lost. Then he finished T4. That's what happened. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if someone's ever won yeah. it. Spieth was one yeah. time of the playoff with uh, with Usti and, and Zach Johnson and Leishman. Yeah, Usti and Zach Johnson. So. Back to betting uh, another guy who's on the comeback trail this year, and uh, I know you will enjoy this. How about Ricky Fowler, 85 to 1? Yep. Good finish, good finish at this may, venue 2011. We know he's a great mm -hmm. player. We know he can, we know if it's a crack ball where it's rain, wet, Ricky Fowler will not give a darn what weather it is. He's the same golfer. Yeah. Absolutely. No, he's got a great open championship record too. I mean, he was, uh, I think he finished T six at this venue back in 2011 as well. Uh, he's finished second at the open before he's got a great open championship record. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's only missed the cut once at the open over his career. I mean, he's just a solid scrambler, you know, his irons are actually coming back to life a little bit. Um, I'm very much in on Ricky this week. You know, people forget it's, it's easy to forget. He was right there kind of in contention at the PGA championship. I mean, I don't think his game is, is very far off or as far off as people think. So um, I'm in on Ricky. Absolutely. He was six at the last open we saw two in 2019. So just throwing that out there. Um, but yeah, I, a player like in the odds, I can definitely get behind a plus 85. And again, you know, he, he's, he's doubled the odds of someone like Fleetwood. And, and I don't know if Fleetwood has really played better than Ricky Fowler this year they've they've actually kind of had similar seasons if we're being honest so i can get behind ricky a lot uh one other name i'll throw out in this range kevin kisner at plus nine thousand. he has really picked it up over his last couple starts two top tens his irons are finally coming back he was striking it so poorly at the start of the year but you know he's gained strokes with his irons like big strokes in his last two starts he's an elite putter and a good short game player and again, one of those guys, if things get like tight down the stretch and the, and the, you know, the weather gets going and everyone starts missing greens, he'll sink those like 10 footers. He'll scramble. He'll hit some fairways. I think Kevin Kisner is very live. Finished T2 at the open in 2018. Yeah. And you think of, and you think of Kevin Kisner's making putts in many ways, the open championship this weekend might not be a stroke play, but more a match play event. Who can make those seven, eight footers? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Down the stretch. I mean, you know, we remember back to 2018 when Molinari won. 
it kind of came down to that. It was just like Molinari was sinking every single 10 foot, eight foot par putt. And the other guys just were, were the ones making bogeys. So Tiger. absolutely. I'll, I'll back a guy like Kevin Kisner in a situation like that. And unfortunately Tiger couldn't make those putts, but uh, he did, did the next year at Augusta. Yeah. And then a couple of old guys, I never thought I would say, but Adam Scott and 110 and one, yeah. the one. Adam Scott at 110 is a great bet. I mean, if you get this price is, I'm a little surprised to be honest. I mean, it's, it's a massive price. I mean, he's not playing poorly or anything, Adam Scott. Um, you know, T13 is last time out, not terrible. Adam Scott is a very, very good open championship player. I mean, another player who lost in a playoff. Uh, not a playoff, excuse me, you know, should have won the Open in 2012. Like, legitimately should have won. Uh, bogeyed his last four holes coming in. He's finished, uh, you know, T3 in 2013 as well. He's just really good at the links, and um, he's played okay in spots. T13 is last time out, like I said. He's putted better too, so kind of like Kisner. Like, you can kind of trust him to make these putts lately. And then uh, I know this guy, I know this last guy has literally not done anything this year, but talk about open talk about streakiness. Matt Kuchar at 250 the one. Am I am I crazy? I mean, Matt Kuchar definitely falls in line with like, you know, Darren Clark kind of winner, right? I mean, like I said, Darren Clark when he came here and won, wasn't really doing much. He wasn't on anyone's radar. He was kind of just like Matt Kuchar. It's like, okay, we got a veteran. He's not, he's kind of falling off his game. Um, you know, is this like his last run? Matt Kuchar, obviously, you know, probably should have won the Open in 2017 until Jordan Spieth had like a 25-minute timeout because of a disagreement with the rules official. And this is the kind of venue where a guy like Kuchar pops up, man. I mean, really, he's, he can get in great grooves on the green with that putting stroke. You know, the lock arm, um, if he can just find a little bit of consistency off the tee, his wedges can can hold him in it. His short game can certainly hold him in it. I, at this price, I mean, it just takes such a low investment that, you know, I'm, I mean, just looking at the names here that he's mixed in. You got Molinari there, I guess. But, you know, for the type of venue we've had, yeah, and, and just the type of, like, putting that we know Kucher can bring, that's probably who I would look to, too. I'm not super bullish on him or anything, but um, – when you, when you put him around the names he's around in the odds, yeah, he sticks out a bit for sure. So uh, now we switch from betting to DraftKings price. Yeah. So if you look at the uh, pricing, uh, John Rahm, as you would expect, is the most expensive golfer at 11300 Roy is 10-9. Brooks is 10-7. DJ at 10-4. And Xander at 10 grand. So, uh, do you think do you think most users will go stars and scrubs or potentially with the volatility of this term use more of a balanced approach? Because I've got to think a balanced approach is gonna be a popular build this week. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, because the prices are softer and you know, we've got some some just some amazing talent like in the low seven K range. I feel like people are just going to try and build super teams. And by super teams, I just mean, you know, fitting in all the big names where you don't have like, you don't, you're basically not punting a spot, right? It's a very popular strategy at, at these major championships. And, and oftentimes when pricing gets this soft, it works out because I mean, when, you know, a guy like Daniel Berger at 7,400 is like your lowest price player. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Right. So yeah, absolutely. I think the balance approach will be very popular this week. But we do have some players like in the lower 6Ks. I mean, Sam Burns obviously sticks out to everyone. But Glover, winner last week, pretty good open player, um, was actually, I think, in the lead at this venue, Dylan, in 2011. After round two, Lucas Glover was. So he's got some synergy at 6,600. And Chris Kirk at 6,400, a very good player. Um, we've got some really cheap options here to work with that you'll probably see, especially in tournaments, guys go with crazier builds like that. You know, if I had like, if I was putting 10 entries into the, to a Millie maker, you know, I would probably, you know, set aside like a good four maybe just to, to, to make builds like that, because you're really going to differentiate yourself. You use a couple guys below 6,700 or something. You stack up a couple of the big guys, uh, your, your, your favorite top two studs, you know, probably for me, it would be like Rom and Thomas or, or Kepka and Rom or Kepka and Thomas. 
And, um, and then you just go from there, you know, having two or even three of those studs is going to set you apart big time. Yeah. I, I made a lineup this way. I made a lineup with a uh, speef Haddon, Reed, Berger, Behezahud, and a Fowler, and, and still have four and left. Although one problem I am already noticing, one, I'm betting Jordan Sweep's going to be the highest owned guy of the top guys because everybody's going to look at his open trajectory. He won here 2017, and I'm thinking no matter if you're doing stalls and scrubs or balance bill, Jordan Sweep fits in every lineup. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Jordan Spieth, um, he's just a fantastic Lynx player. He really is. It's funny. You know, every time the Open comes around, I, I always try and, like, remind people. I mean, people love to talk about Jordan Spieth's Augusta record, and it's really good. It's amazing, actually. But I really do feel like this is, the, the like, the best major for him. I mean, it's random. It, it comes down to lots of just, like, guile around the greens. And, you know, what you do off the tee here, it's important. I'm not suggesting you can just, like, hit it wherever you want, but – you can make up for it with, with really good iron play and around the green play. I mean, um, so everybody's going to miss greens this week. And that, that really favors a guy like Jordan Spieth, who's got, you know, an amazing short game. So uh, who do you think will be the highest own guy this week? Uh, who's leading the ownership on fantasy national? Yeah, no, I mean, um, well, without looking at the, I haven't actually looked at the percentages because it's so early in the week, but I mean, I, I got some bold predictions for that, for sure. I definitely think Spieth will be up there. Um, potentially, Spieth even ends up being, like, the highest-owned player. I mean, he's less than Bryson. He's less than Xander. He's less than Dustin Johnson. And he's shorter than all those guys in the odds. And he's a lot cheaper than Rory. And he's a lot cheaper than Rom too, right? Now, Rom obviously, in his own class right now. But, you know, Spieth, you could make the argument, should be, like, the second favorite here, just because of how good his open championship record is, how good his recent form is. So for him at 9,700, I feel like people are going to look at that and be like, that is a massive discount. I think the only thing keeping Spieth from being the highest owned player is that he's slightly more expensive than Justin Thomas. And I think some people like myself will choose to use Justin Thomas. So Spieth will definitely be up there, um, you know, going down. The, I mean, I, it, the, the talent is so loaded at some of these positions that it's probably going to, kind of eat at itself but i you know daniel berger will be the the next guy i mean if, mm. it's probably going to be speed or berger uh berger just he's cheaper than lee westwood he's the number 16 player ranked in the world and he's the same price as matt wolf who's not even playing now i guess uh same price as phil mickelson actually cheaper than phil mickelson it's ridiculous the same price as francesca molinari who's playing like garbage right so um daniel berger like at least a thousand dollars too cheap, probably more like fifteen hundred dollars too cheap, and um, you know people will take advantage. It's it's a ridiculous price, and um, yeah, I fully expect him to be one of the top two players on this week. When I saw when I saw Berger's price tag, I'm like, what? What? I thought he. I think I thought there was another Danilo burger was... in the field. You know, I thought I was like, was there like a Danilo burger or something from like you know the Maltese Islands or something? I don't know, but. There isn't. It's just down. It's just good old Daniel Berger at seventy four hundred. Way too I cheap. Was, so. I thought it would have been. I thought he would have been like mid eights. I mean, the DraftKings. The DraftKings watch Pebble Beach. <laughs> Does, yeah, it, you know, it's just one of those things. Maybe it's like his Open Championship record. I don't. I, I don't know why Daniel Berger, quite frankly, didn't get any respect this week in the salary. But um, one of those things we're we're gonna live with and. Um, yeah, it's going to make for interesting roster building. Uh, you can, you know, again, if I had 100 lineups, I'd be more apt to, like, put Daniel Berger in 80 or 90 of them than, like, put him in 20 of them. I'd rather be overweight Daniel Berger than underweight. So, but it is uh, – I understand. Like, he's going to be super chalky. Yep. Yeah, so uh, speaking of chalk, we talked about maybe good chalk. Who would be some bad chalk? Because I think of a guy in the eights who's often – Stupid popular in majors, Paul Casey, but this week he's 800, 1,000 bucks more expensive than he usually is in a major. And I think everybody won't give a darn and he'll be chalking again. But could this week be bad chalk in a way? I, oh man, yeah, Casey is one of those guys. This, 
you know, this major typically actually hasn't really been that great for him. I mean, he almost won at St. Andrews in 2015 or 2010, excuse me. But, you know, otherwise we haven't seen Paul Casey in contention at the Open that much. I, I'm very, like, I'm not sure what I think about Paul Casey this week yet. I, maybe that says something, but he could make for an interesting fade. Um, not necessarily like a must play for me, although I'm still deciding I might bet him or something. Yeah, he could be he could be the pivot. Um, it's it's hard to say. Like we have such cheap prices on a guy like Daniel Berger. Like it's impossible to say. Like oh, Berger is like the bad shock this week. But um, you know, th- there are some players like maybe an Abraham Answer who always gets a little bit overowned. You know, I, I don't even hate Answer's game for this event. But you know, you've got players like Sergio up there with great Open Championship records. Uh, even a player like Westwood, like probably really good pivots off a guy like answer who doesn't have that experience. Um, so something to think about there. Yoki Neiman might be a good fade for that reason as well. He's obviously coming off a really good start, but um, you know, someone who's maybe a little bit fadeable. So a couple guys to think about there. Um, just looking down here, see if there's any other players. Like I'm really kind of being or out on no one, no one specifically, but going to be interesting to see when we get the ownership projections i mean i i I feel like xander shoffley again is probably going to be someone i fade i I think at the top i like xander a lot he's very consistent he's a good grinder but when he's more expensive than spieth and justin thomas and even bryson even louis if we're being honest he's just a good fade i mean it's only 700 dollars to get up to, to brooks and i would just way rather do that than pay down for for shoffley if you because if you're gonna pay down, you can just go down all the way to, to like Thomas or, or even Usti. So yeah, Shoffley for me is is like another one of those players. I'm probably just gonna be out on this week. Yeah, I'm just thinking if you got three or four hundred bucks and you could and say, Well, I'd rather have Xander or DJ. I'm taking DJ all week because he's played yeah. four more open championships. Yeah, DJ's not coming with the best form. But we've, but Xander has not gotten over there, and you know, lately the Open Championship has been one where veterans have typically won. I think uh, I've got this stat from old buddy Ben Ross. Uh, actually, I've got this stat from you, no less. Seven of the last nine Open winners have been thirty-two old. Right. Yeah. No. Exactly. Right. So I mean, a lot of veteran stuff going on at the Open experience definitely matters here you know playing the open before uh being of a certain age playing it a few times at least Shoffley's played it a few times and look I'm not I'm not suggesting like I I think this is a major Shoffley could win he certainly almost won in 2018 when he finished I think T2 but you know he's played good he's T10 at the Scottish last week I just you look at the pricing and you can't really make an argument that he should be more expensive than any of those players, you know, those three players directly beneath him. Well, maybe Bryson, but still, um, going to be a, going to be a fairly easy fade for me. And you know, he'll still get ownership. Like people will use Xander this week. There's no doubt in my mind. He won't be as popular as Spieth, but he'll be up there. He don't expect to get Xander like 10% or lower. I'm pretty sure he's still going to be, you know, probably close to 15% if I had to guess. So uh, ultimately, who lifts the Claire Jug Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning here, whenever it is? Yeah. In the US. Oh, no, America. This is one of those events where, you know, most people like the, you know we pick, we pick one of like the top twenty players in the world or the top fifteen players in the world, and you know, you feel pretty good about your call. It's an elite player. I I don't really have a call like that. Like I don't really have someone that that just sticks out and set and says, okay, yeah, like. You know, uh, Jordan Spieth's playing so good right now. I feel so good that, like, this is his time. The stars are aligning and, and things are going to click. I really do think it's going to be someone like like another Shane Lowry win. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm going to pick Mark Leishman because I, I think it's that type of player that wins this. I think it's someone in that range from, like, plus 3,000 to, to plus 100, maybe even, like, plus 150. And I think Leishman just sets up as the type of player who's – competed in majors numerous times over the last few years he's a very good open player his game is humming right now and i think i think things are just going to click here for him I, I really think there's that chance so i'm going to make leishman my pick but 
there's about 20 people like Leishman that you could probably make that argument for. So it is the open, um, you know, be careful with, with making too many proclamations this week because things will go so bad once your player hits into a pop bunker on hole five or something. So, but I'm, uh, I'm going to take Leishman. I'm going to go a little bit off the radar for this last major. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, we well, got one tr- one trend that I've seen in the last three Open Championships at uh, Royal St. George. What has the last name of the winner? What has b- been common of the last three last names of the Open Champion winner at Royal St. George? Okay, so we had uh, Darren Clark, Ben Curtis. So both start with a C. And that, didn't we have Greg Norman in 1993? Greg Norman in 93. You know what they all have in common? No, I don't. Tell me. They're all six-letter last names. Okay. I can, I can go with that. And you know who else has got a six-letter last name? It's not Louis Eustazen. <laughs> no, sorry. Although I do like him this way. Jordan Spieth. Jordan Spieth. All right, man. That's the synergy we need. Uh, I I think Jordan Speed. I think this is the time Jordan Speed. If this is a crap ball week, and I think it is with rain, wind, and Lord knows what weather conditions there be, I think Jordan Speed wins. So, uh, do you have a score? A score? Um, I think it was minus five here the last time. Yes, minus clock one and five on there. I'm gonna say minus. Having looked at the weather. Uh, I'm going to say minus eight. I think, I think it would be a little bit better scoring, but not much. Uh, I'm thinking six under, but okay. I'm thinking six under, especially with this weekend blowing potentially 20 to 25 miles an hour. Yeah. It's yeah not- maybe say, minus eight might be a little bit bullish by me. Well, I'll, I'll dial it down to seven. I think seven sounds good. Maybe Spieth wins by two there, you know, or something, or, or Leishman, you know, Gets hot with the putter. But, yeah, let's say seven. Yeah, it's too higher than Darren Clark. I think I think that's a good good call. Yeah, I mean, if it's six, seven under this week, I'm more than happy with it. I hope it's not like 99 where Paul Lowey won in, what, what was it, five or six over? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm all for the chaos and the carnage, so that's okay with me. I, I'd, be, I'd be quite happy to see a winner at plus six, but that's just me. I, I, I like watching the absolute carnage. More carnage, the better. Yeah, you're tr- trying to think what – trying to think the 06 and 07 U.S. Open when both champs were plus five must have run, must have run great music two years, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those are my favorite events, man. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for hopping on, and, uh, we, w- and uh, we wish uh, all, you and my bets and DFS plays all the best this week. Absolutely, man. Thanks a lot for having me, Dylan. Appreciate it again.